let me make sure that I have I'm recording correct. So if it is the empty list, then we just output the initial value. If it is not the empty list, let's say the first element is X again, then what we do is instead of doing the operation first, uh, on the out outer uh, scope, we basically pass it on to the accumulator. So we do this like that. Right. Yeah, that seems to compile. So if I have some things like one, two, three, four, uh, let's say this is a list. Fold R will work on the list like that. Like imagine that there is some operation going on in here. So it does something like that. But fold L will do it in the other order. So it will do it like So this, the difference in this definition makes sense to everyone, right? So notice one thing that um, this particular definition does not lend itself to laziness. So for example, in the past, we said something like if I have my folder and then I have, uh, I take something like that. And let's say I have this and I do this. This just gives me the head of the list because this operation is lazy. It doesn't depend on the second argument, but I can't do something like this because um, it will try to first work this out on the rest of the list. And th this operation does not terminate because it is going to process the rest of it first. So does it make sense to everyone why this thing cannot be lazily evaluated? because um, it's some, it is like this, right? So even though four is at the end, like to the outermost call over here is this. And to do this call, you need to know what is at the end of the list. So this thing just gets, uh, gets like uh, accumulated in the accumulator. So um, let's, consider something like my fold L plus uh, so this takes a while and how this thing is done is something like this it is done it looks basically something like that and one of the things is that since Haskell is lazy, when it sees this particular call, it does not simplify this right away. It just keeps it as, as is. So what I mean by that is like, um, let's say that I want to do this on this big list. So in the first, after the first call, it looks something like, let me turn off the profile out again. So it looks something like one plus two, and then it is something like uh, three dot dot one million. And then after the second call, like after it processes the next thing, it looks something like that. And this big thing over here, this gets pile, like piling up. So at the end of like the several steps, what you get is some big thing like that, except that it has a million, uh, in this expression, there are like a million nodes rather than just four. So this, yeah. So, uh, 
here what i'm doing is i'm uh, looking at how much time it takes so you can turn this on by doing this command so uh, it so that is why it's printing this so i will now show you uh, one optimization which you can do by um, sort of removing the laziness in here so in this case it is kind of a bad thing that this is lazy because it is building up this expression which is taking a large amount of memory and it is basically taking double the time because uh, there is like half of the steps where you need to uh, unfold this expression to get something like that and then there are more steps like this where you uh, actually reduce it so it would be good if instead of uh, building an expression like that over here we could just uh, have just a number over here so there is an primitive operation in haskell which uh, lets you evaluate something in a strict manner so i will show you how to do that so let's say that i have so now i am going to define a more strict version and let's call this particular thing in it prime and what i am going to do is i am going to define in it prime as this in that but that does not by itself help at all so we are going to use this function which is uh, rather magical because you can't define it with normal haskell this function is called cq or sequence basically so i'm going to say this and what that means is so let's look at the type of cq or or the sequence function what it does is that it returns the second argument basically but uh, it does an additional thing is which is that it evaluates this to well not exactly normal form but um almost normal form so in this particular case what it will do is it will instead of making having an expression like that over there an unevaluated expression it will make sure that these expressions are always collapsed so if we have the fold l prime this thing will actually look like 6 and this thing will actually look like 3 so we will always make sure that the accumulator is um evaluated let's see if that works so this takes 67 seconds and if this thing is any better it should take less time uh okay it's not that much better maybe i'm not defining it correctly let's see let me add hmm oh yeah thank you that's also so the yes precisely okay. Does task of weighting very careful program yes conceptually yes basically it would build up an expression like that and then it would have to spend like another so many steps to evaluate this so this takes 40 seconds with the strict version uh 0.40 seconds this takes much more so this difference makes sense to everyone right yes so i have i have like added this particular thing and um at a very high level of semantics this is just this so it is very same is is the same as this as far as the value is concerned but when i write it like that it makes sure that this particular argument is evaluated to head normal form yes so it actually has slightly different semantics because it throws an error well you know later on it's going to be evaluated anyway but right away you can throw an error yes uh, so if in fact i i don't know what the valid evaluation order in haskell but you try to give us an example yeah if i think if you uh, if in it prime 3 when error this error would 
be thrown much earlier. Right, right. So the order of which errors appear is better. Yeah. Does it make sense? So it basically doesn't build up a. So over here, like there would be a big expression like this built up in this particular argument, but it we avoid that by like making sure that it is evaluated at every point. So we it's don't. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There are a few other tricks to like enforce strictness in different places. Uh, we won't talk very much about them here. So I want to share another thing. There is a mod, let's say that um, you wanted to have this particular definition of fold del prime. So this is not there in the standard, in the prelude. So the uh, library that is imported by default is called prelude, but it is a part of the standard library if you import data.list. So now you can have this fold del prime, which is basically what I am, what I have written as fold del, the fold del prime. So uh, actually, I will take a break to show you this particular library and how you can uh, access these things. So if you, this is a website called Hackage, or similarly, there is something called Stackage, and in data dot list, like you can see all these functions defined. And if you need to use them, you can basically import them like that. So you can, um, oh. you can uh, add an import on the top of your code like this. And this is how you import things so you can do this which basically says that i just want to import the fold del prime and if you don't put this it basically imports all the functions or constants defined in that library and uh, another useful trick to know is that you can do something like that and then if you want to refer to fold fold l you can uh, do something like l dot Fold L prime. So uh, this is a useful trick to know. Um, by the way, there is also this website called Google. You can search things by type over here, or you can put in like the name of a function and it will tell you what library to import or where this is defined. So like, if I put this, it says that this is in Fold L prime. So yeah, th that's very convenient and useful to know. Um, so yeah, that is all I have to say about folds for now. Uh, I talked a little bit about importing modules. One module that I want to talk about, which is sometimes useful is this module called uh, can people see the screen okay? Maybe I should zoom. It's something called debug.trace. And this, uh, so let's say you want to have this particular thing over here. Let me just copy that from the previous. So for some reason, let's say that I want to know what uh, arguments these are being called with. So I can add this particular piece of syntax. Actually, this is not quite syntax. I will tell you how this works. So this will uh, print an extra message on the screen saying that this happened.
work. Uh, So if I call cylinder so it prints this extra thing. You should like it, you should remove all of these things from your final code, of course, but it is very useful to know this trick. And how this basically works is that there is this function called trace, and the type of trace is something like that. It takes this string and this argument. So here I have written false which means that this pattern basically evaluates to false. It returns the second argument, but it has this extra side effect of printing this. So this is not quite your Haskell code, but this is just for debugging. So um, it basically, this entire thing basically just evaluate, this entire thing basically just evaluates to false. And this is why this guard, entire guard evaluates to false and this, uh, Haskell thinks that this guard is not satisfied, so it moves on to the second definition. It's uh, just a useful trick to know. Um, okay, so now actually we will talk more about uh, different kind of types and data types we have in Haskell. So the first thing I want to start with is what I call type synonyms. So if you want to de define a type synonym, you can do something like this. So let's say uh, I have a list of integers, but for some reason I want to refer to that as an increasing list. I can do this. So let's say I want to define a uh, merge. I can write it like that. And I will not like give the definition now. And what I can do is I can call this particular function with something like that. And it should, uh, it, I, I can call the function with something like that. So notice one thing that this is just a synonym. So it does not distinguish between actual, actual list of ints and increasing, uh, list. it's just that like they can be uh, substituted for one another. So this is just a convenient way to mark your code with, uh, if you have like some particular thing in mind, but you don't want to, uh, define that in a semantic way. You can just hint that particular thing by saying that giving it a different name. So this is just a different name for a type. This is kind of like type defs in yes. When you do this, you're sort of on your honor as a programmer to all the use cases. So this would be Yes. So yeah, this doesn't, this cannot, yeah, this cannot check. Yeah. We, we will talk about like some other tricks to make sure like some constraints are enforced, but this is, this does not actually enforce any kind of constraints. It just is a, a convent, like a kind of marker. So it, it, for example, cannot check that this is really an increasing list. So, yeah, maybe increasing list is not a good uh, example, but I could have something like this, which is abbreviation for that. By so, in this case, like I'm not really making any promises, but just giving this another name. So um, let's make these things more complex. So these things can take in parameters. So let's say that I could define a trace of type A as something like this. And basically like an example of a trace would be something like this. So this is a, this is a trace the, instead, this basically stands for int arrow int since this particular A has been instantiated with int. So this is basically the identity function on integers. I'm calling this a trace because 
you can think of this as an infinite uh, array like that and for each and for each of the elements there is a particular value but this is a infinite uh, array so the, these are the indices these are the values so yeah this is just a way to make this synonyms and it's good to know that these things can take in parameters so now let's say that uh, yeah so what do you mean like yes so actually we can actually we can write it like that and it it's fine and with, so it's indistinguishable yeah uh, i mean this particular thing is like has the type aroa but when i right. when i bind it it is like that particular type is instantiated yes so uh, in this particular kind of uh, forming like type definitions these things are interchangeable like i could write int arrow int wherever i want as well as int function they are like interchangeable but what if i want something to be non interchangeable so let's say that i want to have some kind of uh, values in my program which uh, express some distance in feet so i could write it like that and this time it's basically a double but uh, it will have an additional constructor saying that this is a feet like this value is in feet so how do you use this kind of uh, yeah. yeah so if i want to do this i can say i think it will like figure that out better so i i i have to use it like that and uh if i want to uh use this particular value over here i have to pattern match this constructor so if i want to write something like that i can't write so i can't write this because then it should complain it should think that like i'm passing some normal double or something like that over here like it is thinking that this is a number but actually there is this constructor it is behind this constructor so you have to write it like that and uh one thing to know is that if you write this this does not have an additional overhead of hiding this behind a pointer as in there is no extra pointer over here so this what that means in terms of semantics is that if this x was an error and let's say that this thing did not depend on the let's say i want to do some mm. actually never mind but yeah this does not introduce a extra indirection yeah but you could also put on the right hand side the vertical bar just other things like yeah i will come to that but yeah so that is a so uh, yeah uh, new type can only have one constructor it is very special for just for like one constructor thing if you want multiple constructors i will tell you what to do also you type you actually just say new type right you say new type speak so yes so notice that type this thing is just a synonym like this means that you can interchange this thing for this thing so in fact if i ask what is uh, what is example trace it will probably tell me that okay it is telling me trace int but anyway uh, the point is that like you can interchange this for this in this particular case but in this case like you can't interchange double for feet it has an extra constructor so you notice that this type and new type are different so uh we have not, like not really done very much over here we have like just added wrappers around things and like given synonyms so let's uh, actually do more stuff
so we are now going to define product types and these are like uh, structs in racket or like structs in your favorite language i guess so let's say i have an ellipse and i the ellipse has two parameters a major axis and a minor axis so i write it like that so if i want to instantiate an ellipse i can say make ellipse 1.0 2.0 so i can what it is it types and it tells me that it is indeed an ellipse so one thing i would say is that i am going to put deriving show over here and what that will do is it will give me a way to print this so previously it was complaining that it can't print this but here now you, i can print this and this is some mechanism i will come back to later but for now if i want to print something i will just put deriving show so um let's say i have this product type or this particular struct kind of thing and i want to pattern match on it let's say i want to find the area of the ellipse so i can pattern match on it on this like before so this is the name of the constructor but these are just variable names i could have called them x and y um so yeah this is how you pattern match on these product types and another thing to know is that uh, i have written make ellipse for the name of the constructor over here but usually it is very common to especially if there is only a uh, one kind of thing it's very common to call the name of the constructor and the type the same thing so i can do this and in this case i can just make the ellipses by just calling ellipse so notice that this particular thing and this particular thing are different things so this lives in the world of values and this lives in the world of types and they they are not the same so i can uh, ask what is the type of ellipse and this ellipse is referring to this and what should be the type of that what is the type of this anybody knows um so the type of this is well it takes in two arguments which are both floats and it gives me an ellipse so the type of this is float arrow float arrow ellipse right and this ellipse is not a not the same as this ellipse like i just said because this ellipse is the constructor and this ellipse is the type so another interesting thing about this product types is what is called record syntax and you already have this in racket is that if you want to assign names to this you can do this so you can still pattern match on that and like i could pattern match it like this and instead of constructing the ellipse like uh, like that i could also construct the ellipse by specifying the fields like that yeah but the page doesn't want it it's just sort of optional that yeah uh, they, they 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 will make accessors so yeah. that is the but if yeah i agree but uh, sometimes you might have like a big configuration or something and let's you have 15 fields and in that case you don't want to write different 15 like patterns in this case it's like i just agree stylistically it's my thing yeah uh maybe in some later class we can see an example like that so here i have not i have just given the ellipse a name like let's call it e actually and then i can say major e 
minor is so there goes the other you have to put those tags of major colon colon and minor colon colon in the data definition then you wouldn't have the names for accessories you may have to you can independently i guess define major and minor using tag right yeah or you can direct right tag as you can point out in a lot of situations yeah so another cool thing about this pattern matching syntax is you can do updates like they're not like mutation updates but they like let's say that you have this ellipse e whose major is two and minor is three well it should have been the other way around um i can construct another ellipse from that like that which has the same minor so uh yeah. Can someone tell me what is the type of major according to like whatever this is? Any answers? Think about accessories What's the type? Yeah. Yes, thank you. So exactly. Um, so maybe one thing I should say is that uh, there is a constraint over here that, or like a constraint in our minds that the major axis should be more than the minor axis. But if I construct something to, through the constructor ellipse, there is no reason that this will be the case. Like I can do this. So sometimes what is done is that you define a different, like you put this in a different module and then you create an extra constructor. Like this is called a smart constructor where you uh, don't use this particular constructor. And then you say that you make this extra check that So I could, uh, instead of using this constructor, I could always insist on using this particular constructor. And then when I do that, I would make sure that whatever objects are constructed that have follow this particular pattern. Like this is not some guarantee that is given to you by the type system, but you can impose this on the users of your library, but by, uh, not exposing this constructor and just exposing this constructor instead. So this is a trick that sometimes people use. So you may want to do something like that for this increasing list. You can't do this in the, in, with type synonyms because they're interchangeable, but you could make it a new type and give it some kind of smart constructor so that the lists are indeed increasing. Um, all right. So these are called product types. Why product types? Because it's as if. I had two components of it and now I'm using both components together. So that's like a product as opposed to what we will now see as, uh, some types. So some types are something like this. Where I'm not going to write all of them. And then I'm going to say deriving show because I think it's good to. And then I can, these are, these are my values. And these are basically like constructors that take no arguments. So if you have used C or C plus plus, these kind of things go by the name of enum. And the difference is that in C, uh, the compiler will convert these enums into integers, but here they are like of the, of a new type called a, and they can't be, uh, interchanged. So I can ask what is the type of Saturday and it will tell me that Saturday is a day. And uh, these are just normal values. So actually most of the time, what the kinds of data types we will see are 
more complex than either some or product they will be like either sums of products or products of some or like more nested than that so let's say i want to have something like this i have let's say i want to have a, a data type which allows for two kinds of shapes so if it's a rectangle then i want uh want to have like a length and a width and if it's a square i just have one parameter so i can construct them like that so wait what yes right so if you wanted to have something like a formula and you said the formula is either a not expression or if expression or something else you would write it like that like with different ors like think of this vertical bar as an or so here i had this new type and here i am calling this data so this data is for this more complex things where i have like several sums or products of different things but if i want to use new type i can't have a uh, a vertical bar in a new type and i have different kinds of uh constructors in the same new type so yeah and i can pattern match on these things like that so this is how you pattern match on this um any questions about any of this so far no okay good so now i want to say that these things can be recursive in the sense that over here i could also have shape that won't be a great example but there is actually an example which you have seen before already so well first of all this is taking a parameter and you have already seen this example i'm just writing it out in a with a different name and what are functional lists they are either nil in which is basically the empty list or they are cons in which case there would be a an element of type a and that would be cons together with the list of type a so this is really how the normal lists are defined except that there is some syntactic sugar for uh, the list that we use there is some way of adding sugar for your own types but um, you can look that up so i i can actually pattern match on this kind of list right by doing something like this this makes sense to everyone right i could pattern match on like these kinds of data types like that um i could also define something like the type of non empty lists by saying that i either want it to be a singleton or it has more elements like that so these things could be recursive and another example i like sometimes is something like this so this is the type of an infinite list in the sense that 
this list this list only allows you only uh, allows you to be infinite so in that case what i want and uh, by the way i could use record syntax over here like i have not given this particular field any name but uh, it's basically called first and this is called rest so i could uh, use use a uh, uh, record record syntax to have those things will that work okay so here is a type called stream and stream is contains a head and a tail which is also a stream so this is very similar to list but it only has the cons case it doesn't have the nil case so a stream is always an infinite list so i can define a stream like that and this is going to, like this makes sense because it's defined in a lazy manner and actually i let me see if i can try to print it i don't know if this will work so it's like that right because the head is one and the tail is another thing which contains the head is one and so this is a so it's twice as stream yes so actually in the assignment that we currently have you will be programming a infinite tree and some kind of functions to take a finite number of elements from that infinite tree or check some uh, finite prefix of that infinite tree so that is basically something like this and now you should know everything in order to work with them you can also pattern match on these things right like you can go ahead yeah that's because i use them yeah that's because i use the uh, record syntax like you can remove that so i guess yeah well, it does need, does print out the name of the constructor so yeah any questions about this no okay good um so another kind of thing which we have already seen is the type of tuples and let's say i have a tuple um i have and just like if i have a type a then i can form a type list of a tuples are kind of like that except that they have two parameters so like if i have int and let's say i have char i have a type which is int comma char uh so this is like a kind of this types are like the tuple type is already built in you could say something like tuple ab equals well tuple ab but this is just a product of two things and this product thing is already built into the language so that because they are in like immensely useful you can also have like tuples of several different things so you could think of uh, tuples as anonymous products why anonymous because consider for example ellipse ellipse is also a product of two things i could have written ellipse as float comma float but ellipse is not anonymous because it has the name ellipse but um you could just have float comma float and that would be an anonymous product so just like tuples are anonymous products there is also a notion of anonymous sums which are called either which is called either so either is basically like that so does it make sense to everyone what this does so a type a value of type either int or bool is i so left so here are some things which look like a, a values of type this so if i say left one this is fine because on the left side i am getting an integer 
I, if I say right true, that is also fine. So this thing is just like tuples and anonymous products. These are anonymous sums. Uh, and these are built into the language. So I can actually, if I say this, it doesn't know, like I'm saying that like put this on the left side, but it doesn't know what is the other side. So it's just keeping it as B. So does it make sense what this either type is? Right, it is basically the union of two types. The difference between uh, normal unions and this is that this is a tagged union. Like, uh, if you have an int, you must first declare it as left. If you have a bool, you must first say that it is right. So this is a tagged union, or this is called a disjoint, uh, a disjoint union sometimes. And um. Actually, these arrows, these arrows are also like a type constructor. So yeah, maybe I should have said this before. So imagine that you have a type int, then you, so if this is a type, if int is a type, which it is, uh, list of int is also a type. So this list is called a type constructor in the same way that non-empty is a type constructor or either is a type constructor. These are called type con type constructors because they are constructors on types. So these are different from value constructors. For example, let's consider the definition of ellipse again. This, this particular thing, which my, I'm putting my cursor on, this takes in two floats and gives me a value. So this is the value constructor ellipse. And this is, well, this is not a type constructor, it's because it's just a type by itself. But uh, in the case of list, this is a type constructor, not just a type because it takes in a type and produces a type. So I, I guess this is kind of an interlude, this kind of, so just like we have types for things, we have, uh, Types of types are called kinds. So I can ask what is the kind of int? So the kind of int is star. So I have a hierarchy like this. I have seven, which lives in int and int lives in star. Um, however, consider either. Either is not a type by itself. Either takes in two types, namely A and B and then uh, becomes a type. Maybe you don't remember the uh, definition of either. So let's look at this particular definition of list. We can ask what is the kind of list and it will tell you that it takes a type and then it becomes a type. So we, we can't have a value that lives inside list. It must live inside some part list applied to some particular thing. Mm. You wanted to say so. Uh, yeah, with some extensions to the language. So another interesting thing is the kind of arrow is that it takes two types and becomes another type. For example, int is a type and uh, float is a type. So int arrow float is a type. So these are what are kinds. Uh, you can have actually more complex kinds, but let's not get into that. Mm. So just like either and tuple types and arrow types, there is another useful type, which is called maybe. And we can ask uh, Haskell to show us what maybe is. And it says that maybe is so this is the kind of maybe let's ignore that for a moment. It says that maybe of A is either nothing or just A. So for example, I could have just seven and it would think that it's, um, let's specifically make this an integer. Then this is a maybe, this is not a normal end. So let me explain what this is useful for. 
with an example i think that is the best way to do this so i will define this function called lookup and lookup has something some type like that so what lookup does is it takes an index call that index i and a table which is indexed by let's say indices so let's say the index and the integer indices of the table both of them are uh, integers so what we will do is we will return the value that corresponds to the that particular index in that table um we can do this by pattern matching of course but i will do this with filter so let's say that this is the x is the index and y is the value actually let's call that let's give it call it by that actually let's call it so we can filter all the elements of this list like that and this will give me a list where all the elements are all the indices are this key and then what i can do is i can take the first element of that list and that first element would be a key value pair so instead of uh, returning the first element i want to return the second component of the first element which would be b let's see if that type checks yeah it does type check that's good so i can use something like So actually, this is a built-in function. So yeah, th th that's how lookup works, right? But the point is that if I have a function like this, it will just throw an error. So. sometimes that's not good we want to be able to catch such errors so instead of having this kind of function we would use the maybe type so here i would say that i have this uh, index and this table and i may or may not return a value and i can implement it like this if the list is empty then i say nothing this is uh this is sort of like returning an error if the list is like that so here i can check that whether i is equal to k then i can just say that uh return the value otherwise i could say do the look up on the rest of the table so now if i do this it tells me it's just b but if i if the table was empty or the element was not there it would tell me that it didn't find anything by saying nothing so this is the reason why the maybe type is very useful um in many languages this is called the option type so i i think java currently has a type called the option type in the standard library you have to import it but um the difference is that uh i think traditionally many java programmers would return null in this case like the null pointer and one reason that's a bad thing is because the null pointer of one value and the null pointer of other value is uh is sort of the same thing but here this particular nothing although like here i would know that this nothing belongs to the type of maybe character and if i wanted to confuse it with something else it would not make sense so i don't know if i can do this so i am trying to check whether this things are equal but i can't even check whether these things are equal because here this nothing belongs to maybe int and here this nothing belongs to maybe character 
so uh, it, it did not tell me it's false it told me that this is a ill typed question mm. so any questions about this one yeah say i find a value What do you mean? So, just if you write down like something, and then I okay, like that. Context, yeah, that won't work. Yeah. Yeah. Let me let so me see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I think I understand your question. Uh, so let's say that, or le let's say that I have this thing which takes in a maybe as input, and uh, regardless of what it is, it always gives me the answer seven. And let's say I have another thing which is nothing of type int. So this nothing. So uh, yeah. Actually, let me make another copy of this to illustrate the point. So I can. So this take maybe once a maybe of bool specifically. So I can pass it this nothing bool and it will give me seven, which is fine. But if I try to pass it nothing int, it will complain because it couldn't match this int with bool. At expected type is maybe bool, but actual type is maybe int. Right? Mm. Any Most other? Yeah. So, variables yeah. So here I could uh, call it maybe a, in which case either is fine. And if I don't give it a type, it would call itself maybe a. Uh, okay. So let's move on. We don't have that much time, but yeah. What is yeah. So if I say V, then that would be a type. The type of V is B, but just is the thing that embeds B into maybe B. So if you uh, ask the definition of maybe, it's either nothing or just A. No, because V is of type B. If I wanted to embed it in maybe, I will have to say just. It doesn't automatically do that. It's kind of like if I want to use like a list of a list containing one, that is not the same as the number one. It is like that. So, yeah. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is actually something we have seen before. We have this thing over here, which I'm calling deriving show. And I have been uh, just wiping it under the wrap for some time, but let's try to understand what this thing is. So I can ask uh, GHCI for information about show. Well, that's a lot of information, but what it does tell us is that it is a class. It is not a type. And it has a kind like uh, the kind of it is star arrow constraint. So what does that mean? So mm, the idea is that when you, when you say deriving show, it automatically defines uh, uh, all of this are like not so much important, but like what it, the most important thing is this, it automatically defines a function called show of type a arrow string. And we can, ask what is the type of show and it says that 
I can give you given some uh, type A, I can give you a string, but this type has to satisfy this constraint called show A. So um, I could ask, so I could uh, type show of and it gives me this. And this is the mechanism via which it is able to print this. So the interesting thing is that there is this function show, which is available for a lot of types because it, it is kind of polymorphic in the sense that this type is kind of general. But the interesting thing is that it does things differently on uh, different types. For example, how it shows a list is not the same as how it shows a stream or how it shows an ellipse. So actually, let's say that uh, I had this ellipse type and I wanted to give it some, uh, I wanted to give it a different way of printing it. So I could do something like this. If I want to pattern match on this, I all of this need to be the inside of parent because they are not different arguments. So now if I say this, it will tell me it's this instead of using the previous representation to show. So this uh, show is, it's possible to define your own show. And the interesting thing is that this show, even though it's polymorphic it does different like behaves differently on different types like i if i uh, have a my rectangle it will not tell me whether it's a square or not it will do this so how we do this kind of thing is what is called uh, what is called ad hoc polymorphism so here for example um, if i have for example um let's say this particular example, safe lookup, it does not depend if uh, it does not behave differently depending on what type B is. However, show does that. So this is called para parametrically polymorphic. But show is uh, what is called ad hoc polymorphic. And the difference between these will be denoted in the types by having these constraints. So here, if you look at safe lookup, this is, this B is just a B, but if I ask for show, it has a constraint like that. So these things are this thing called show, for example, this is called a type class. And the type class lets you uh, define different instances of this particular function show. So again, I could look at this, uh, type, uh, this, uh, show. And what it tells us is that this is a class which has to have this. So think of this as more like a Java interface rather than a class in, in the sense that this thing is always abstract and you have to, you have to give this a definition if you want you. So this uh, type a is a member of this class. When you say instance, uh, instance show ellipse, ellipse become a member of the class show. So actually let's look at another example of something like this. Uh, let's consider this example again, safe lookup. So here I made this indices with the type int. But again, there is no reason why this should be int. like, I could have the keys of this to be strings or something else. So I could try to make this general and let's see what happens. What do you think should happen?
so here it says that i am using equality over here but this a on this a equality is not necessarily defined and uh, the point is that this to be able to use equality we need to know what equality means on that type so for example if you have two functions it is not clear how to test their equality you can try to test it with a couple of inputs or you could uh, just always say that they're different or you could look at pointer equality or something like that so it is not clear how to uh, have equality on certain things so i could say eqa over here to make sure that this equality makes sense on this thing and now so if i uh, do this it makes sense because equality is defined on this but if i if for some reason the keys were ellipses it will complain that there is no way to come know the equality between ellipses and well ellipses are really simple things so well uh, at least in this case so i could just say deriving eq over here and this will automatically tell haskell how to define the equality for ellipse which is simply that the ellipse is equal if the two ellipses are equal if their major axis and minor axis are the same so now it works uh, any questions about this yes yeah yeah though actually this deriving mechanism goes uh, quite far i think we can do that oh. we need to put parent i don't understand why but you can define them on recursive types as well i think yeah so i think how that works is that like if you wanted to do this it would need to assume that there is an equality on a and use that equality to infer the equality on this so uh, actually we can uh, i will show you how to do that in a minute that's a good point thanks so actually if i bring up the information for eq um i will come to that in a moment okay so here let's say i have this if i wanted to uh, i could derive eq for and let the compiler do the work but let's say for some reason i want to uh, do eq of this a actually this outer parents are not necessary in this case and it says the minimal definition is this like i could um, so so i have to give them different names otherwise it will complain that like those l and that l are not the same then i will have to say uh, and it knows that this uh, this equality refers to this equality which i am defining right now it's a recursive definition and if i try to check if any in two other things are equal then that is false so do you think this will compile well no because um here i am asking for the equality of these things but there is no reason why there is a notion of equality defined on this particular thing so actually i have to say that this makes sense if there is a type notion of equality defined on this then from that i can infer a notion of equality on that so i have to add this extra thing over there i i think that is the syntax yeah so th this is how it works um any other questions
let me see another thing so last time i defined this quick sort and actually i have defined this on integers for simplicity but there is no reason this has to be integers right and if i try to do this it will again complain uh, anyone wants to say why hmm? so what is the issue this time that we need to know how to be able to compare these i think someone brought that up in the last class so well that's a good thing so here it says in order to know how to compare these things we are looking for the presence of the type class which allows us to compare things so i could put that annotation and then it says that okay this works for any kinds of lists but uh, it just has to be the case that they are we are able to order them and if i look at the type of uh, if i look ask for information about this it tells me one interesting thing which is that this dependency so this is saying that uh, in order to have something as ord we must first define the eq on it so so you in other words you can't have two things to be uh, you can't define the order a uh, class on a type without first defining this thing on a type so this is kind of like a uh, what do you call it like a subclassing mechanism it's saying that this in order to have this interface defined you must have this interface defined first so anything that is orderable also is also has equality by default so if i put this it won't complain that you have no you like it, it won't make sense for a quick sort but it it doesn't complain that you have not a uh, define this it's not eq because this automatically tells us that eq has been defined because of the way that the class ord is defined so one last thing before we leave is uh so i had this scalar product which i had defined on floats i can define this with this is fine but uh, i can define this on any kinds of numbers and there is a definition of like what this thing is it basically refers to the fact that it basically refers to the fact that uh, you have a notion of multiplication addition and those things so yeah in order to make something a make something a number you need to have addition these things and here it says that these are the minimal things that are necessary so for example either you could have the negation function defined or you could define minus if you define one it will automatically define the another based on that um so yeah i guess we are out of time any questions about this no well that's good um so the, for example in the assignment there is a problem where uh, you I, i use the annotation of fractional values which is where you can divide one thing by another which is not necessarily there in the definition of num so you might see this annotation the fractional annotation in the assignment in the next class we will talk about some more things about type classes thanks everyone